Happier Days, written by Jennifer Jew. Wendy is digging a large hole. Stephen is jogging in Wendy's direction. He is listening to music, oblivious to his surroundings. Stephen gets hit by a shovel full of sand, which gets his attention. What the? Hey, watch it. Wendy continues to dig, flinging sand in random directions. I said, watch it. Wendy does not respond. Irritated, Stephen takes another step forward and cranes his neck to get a better look at the digger. You know, you really should pay attention. Wendy? Wendy ignores him. Sand is flying as she digs. Wendy! Wendy Weston, is that really you? Wendy continues to ignore Stephen. She is still digging. It, it's Stephen! Stephen Jacobson? We went to high school together? Wendy starts flinging sand towards Stephen as she digs. It, it's been a while, but you still look the same. I haven't changed since high school. Well, I mean, more or less. Wendy digs even more furiously. You know, I, I loved your book, Devils in the Details. I, I tried to get a ticket the last time the book tour was here, but the talk was all sold out. I, I don't want to bother you now, but I'd love to ask you. <laughs> you know what? Just forget it. As Stephen walks away, he steps on a partially buried second shovel in the sand, and he barely avoids getting hit in the head with it. Hey! the hell? Oh my god. Uh, wasn't sure which one to bring, so I brought both. Are you okay? Yeah, I guess. What the hell are you digging this hole for? Do you want a hand? Stephen picks up the other shovel and starts to dig next to her. Wendy watches him for a moment, then plops down in the middle of the hole. What? What the? Dump the sand on me. I, I don't get it. Just do it. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> What's going on, Wendy? What a mess. What, the sand? Don't worry about it. The tide will wash it all away. It's so stupid. What is? Me. This. What are you talking about? You probably don't know Happy Days. You mean the show? Hey! No, it's a play by Samuel Beckett. The guy who wrote Waiting for Godot? You've heard of him? Yeah, uh, AP English class, remember? Uh, you don't remember. Um, you don't. I'm sorry, it was such a long time ago. You didn't know me back then, you and your in crowd. That was so stupid. Didn't feel that way at the time. You were well liked, Stephen. You were in the band, you played trumpet. Trombone. Debate team. Math club. You were on stage crew. I was the lead in Fiddler on the Roof. You were? No, I was villager number four. Do you think you know me, but you really didn't? I, on the other hand, knew all about you. Head cheerleader, prom queen, class president. Eating disorder, train wreck, broken home. I, I didn't know. No. You did, didn't. But your life seems so perfect. <laughs> yes. Me and my perfect life. You were admired, Wendy. People liked you, looked up to you, wanted to be you. Whatever. <laughs> you have no clue. You know what? Forget it. All that was a lifetime ago. I'm going to leave you to it, whatever this is. Stephen starts to walk away. Wait! Stephen keeps walking. Don't you want to know what I'm digging this hole for? Nope. 
Stephen keeps walking. I want to bury myself alive. Stephen freezes, trying to find the right words to say. What? Are you? You're kidding, right? No. Stephen cautiously walks a few steps towards Wendy. Why? It's hard to explain. Try me. Back to Beckett. Happy days. One of the characters gets buried deeper and deeper in sand and disappointment. Oh. She, eventually she's buried up to her neck. What happens in the end? Probably nothing good. Oh, we don't know for sure. I doubt it's happily ever after. What do you mean? Life doesn't work that way. Look at me. I'm a has-been. I haven't written a new book in years. Am I a writer if I no longer write? We all go through dry spells. What would you do know about that, Stephen? I'm a writer too, Wendy. But unlike you, I've never been published and no one has read anything I've written. I mean, besides my mom and great aunt Mildred. Stop, you have a great aunt Mildred? Yes, I really do. I'll send you one of her brick hard fruitcakes during the holidays. <laughs> Sounds like a character in a book. Life imitates art. Oscar Wilde. <laughs> yeah, I've always loved his works. Me too. When did you start writing? In college. MIT, right? Yeah. But then my dad died, and I switched schools to be closer to home to help my mom out. Worked as a waiter at Olive Garden nights and weekends. Still gag when I think about unlimited breadsticks and all you can eat salad. Well, oh. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, I don't think most people know what really goes on beneath the surface. It's lonely. It is. Look at me, Stephen. I'm, I'm all alone. I'm in a goddamn hole. If they could see me now. Wendy. I'm a failure. I can't keep a long-term relationship. No kids. I put all my eggs in the career basket. And now that's shriveled up too, just like everything else. Hey, that is not. I can't. I can't stand it. I feel stuck. Numb. It's never too late to start again. <laughs> that sounds like something from one of those cheesy self-help books. I've written several self-help books, Wendy. Oh, no, no, no. I, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I, I write mostly mystery. C keep going, Wendy. You don't know what I've been through. I don't. But we all struggle living lives of quiet desperation. The row. Yeah. And he also said, it's not what you look at, but what you see. If there's hope beyond this hole. No one really understands. Wendy starts to shovel again. Wendy. <sighs> Wendy. Wendy oh. continues to dig, ignoring Stephen. Stephen watches Wendy for a minute, then walks all the way to Wendy and jumps into the hole with her. Hey! What? No room in the inn? What are you doing? Now, I like what you've done with the place. Nice earth tones. I hear that's all the rage. You're crazy. I know you are, but what am I? You're insufferable. But I'm here. I just want to give up. I think we all do at some point in our lives. I know I did. You did? It was right after the breakup. Ten years together and Sam just left. I'm sorry. Then another book projection. <laughs> I was really struggling. You know how that feels. 
I became a recluse. Even the Yentas no longer thought I was much of a catch. Yikes, the Yentas. <laughs> yeah. I was in this crappy, rundown house that I'd moved to after the breakup. I wanted to be anywhere else, anyone else. Then, of course, Hurricane Irene hits. It was so bad. The whole state was out of power for days. I was in a really dark place, literally and figuratively. Day after day, sitting in the stifling heat, rotten, stinking food in the fridge, dead phone, no one to talk to. Nothing was working, including my life. Yeah. I was sick of trying and getting nowhere. And then I thought, well, there's one thing I haven't tried. So, I make my way down to the dark basement and get the box that Sam forgot and left behind. He keeps the dog. I get his box with a bottle of stinky cologne and a crap from his nightstand. Great. Why do you still have that box? Ah, uh, because part of me didn't want to accept it was really over. So I reach into the box and pull out the gun he kept by the bed. Something he insisted on having to protect himself because he said I wasn't man enough to do it. I put a bullet in it and I sit holding it for a long time. A long, long time. And as I'm sitting there, rubbing the barrel of the gun with my hand, thinking, thinking, the doorbell rings. And oh God, it keeps ringing. And I'm really annoyed because it just won't stop. I, I could have ignored it, but I don't know. Something made me say, well, just go upstairs, answer the door, get rid of them, then blow your brains out later if you want to. Who was it? It was some delivery guy holding a cat that was run over in front of my house. Oh my God. Yeah. He wanted to know if it was mine or if he should try to bring it to a vet or something. There were no tags or anything. The cat looked really hurt. What did you do? I took the cat and brought it to the vet myself. The vet checked him out, ran tests, and luckily there were only a few broken bones. It was a slow recovery, but he made it. Did you keep the cat? I did. No one ever came for him. People say I saved his life, but he saved mine. What's his name? Pancake. Pancake? Yeah, because he was almost flattened like a pancake. But it was between that and roadkill. Oh my God, no. <laughs> that was my rock bottom. It's still hard, but it's better. Stephen picks up a rock and skips it across the water. How do you move on? One day at a time. One second at a time. Didn't you think that life was going to end up being so much more than this? Sometimes. I haven't had my big break. My day job sucks. But the future has yet to be written. It feels too risky to hope. Yeah. A part of you still wants to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, right? You really get off on Thoreau, don't you? <laughs> like, OMG, I totally hurt Thoreau. I don't think the kids actually talk like that. Yeah, no. We're old fogies. I feel like my life is over. It's not over. We forget we're so much more than what we do for work, more than what we have or don't have, more than what life throws at us, more than this. Maybe you're right. Well, someone actually thinks I'm right? Who'd have thunk it? I guess the ladies would call me Mr. Right. Oh, God, no. <laughs> what, you don't think I'm very punny? Uh... Stephen looks out at the water. 
Tide's coming even more. Yes, it has. So much for this. Would have washed away. Clean slate. A chance to start again. Stephen uses his arms to lift himself out of the hole, then sits on the edge, legs still dangling into the hole. Come on. Can we get you out of here? Stephen leans over and reaches his hand down to Wendy. Wendy looks at it. Like it would say, always in dire need of a hand. We all are. Doesn't make you weak. You're not alone, Wendy. Does it really get better? Yes. What if it doesn't? Nothing lasts forever, even the bad times. You could have fooled me. No two moments are the same. Each second gives us another chance for change, for a new choice. You're stronger than you know. I'm tired, Stephen. I know. I'm here. Wendy looks up at Stephen's hand, then at Stephen's face then back at Stephen's hand again. She puts down the shovel. Blackout. Closet Door, written by Moon Abbott. Interior office building, day. The windows of an upbeat advertising agency face downtown Chicago in the winter of 1976. Various employees keep busy. Salesmen sit at and around their cubicles, some talking to clients on the phone while others talk to each other. Ringing phones are quickly answered by secretaries sitting at their desks and rows. Some shuffle through papers, others take notes. Raymond, 30 to 35, an austere polished account supervisor, walks by the desk of Shirley, 28 to 32, an organized reserved secretary. Mm, hello, Mrs. Walker. You're looking beautiful today. Stop it, Ray. Sorry. Am I coming on too strong? Don't you have some work to get back to, Mr. Walker? <laughs> Raymond smiles playfully at Shirley and walks away from her desk. Shirley rolls her eyes. The secretary sitting next to Shirley giggle at her. She blushes, but chuckles with them, then returns back to work. Cut to... Interior break room. Same. At a table sits Michelle, 26 to 30, a secretary. While she maintains a friendly demeanor, she almost always looks like she's fighting the urge to say what she really means. At the table with Michelle is Linda, 30s, and Pamela, also secretaries. All three of them smoke cigarettes. Linda and Pamela are deep in conversation while Michelle simply observes, paying little attention. And you know what? I didn't see her husband with them at church the next day. Oh, now that's interesting. Isn't it? Something must be going on with their marriage. That's what I think. It sure seems that way, huh? What do you think, Michelle? About what? Doesn't it sound like they're having problems? Oh, I guess I wouldn't know. Ah, oh, you and Jerry are so sweet. That little James is so lucky to have you too. You get along better than any married couple I know. That's for sure. Oh, that reminds me. I heard Donna's husband's been going out of town a lot recently. Cut to interior office building, same. Salesmen making casual conversation walk out of a meeting room and head to their cubicles. Jerry, 27 to 31, a high energy, friendly salesman, is stopped by Thompson, 50 to 60, his boss, as they both leave the meeting room. Jerry. I gotta say, that deal you closed yesterday was very impressive. It's looking like our biggest closure of the month. Uh, I was really nothing. They were almost too easy to win over. Hey, well, either way, great work. And keep it up, Bauer. Uh, you got it. Jerry gives Thompson a smile as they part ways. Through the sea of secretaries, Michelle makes her way to her desk, which has a somewhat organized clutter to it. Jerry approaches Michelle's desk as she sits down. Hey, hon. Hi, Jer. Do you have a plan for dinner tonight? 
Oh, I was thinking maybe baked ziti again, if that's all right. You know exactly what I like. Jerry checks his watch. Could you do me a favor and ring Raymond for uh, two o'clock? Sure thing. Jerry walks away and Michelle picks up her desk phone. Before she can dial, her desk neighbor, 60s, leans over. Your domestication is so admirable. After an annoyed blink, Michelle forces a polite smile in her direction. She dials a number. Cut to... Interior Raymond's office, continuous. Raymond sits at his desk in his personal office. A framed picture of Raymond and Shirley is propped up right by the ringing phone. Uh, Raymond Walker? Jerry's on the way for your two o'clock. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Michelle. As Raymond hangs up the phone, there's a knock at the door. Jerry enters the office. He closes the door behind him. He locks it. Cut to... Interior office building, continuous. Michelle returns back to work, filing through some papers. She becomes distracted by Shirley. Their desks face each other across the row, but at a diagonal. Shirley concentrates as she takes notes. Michelle stops her work to stare. Shirley glances up and notices Michelle staring. Shirley flashes a smile at Michelle. Michelle smiles back. A salesman walks by Shirley's desk. Shirley glances at him as he passes, breaks her smile, then promptly returns back to her note-taking. Michelle stares for a moment longer before returning to her papers. Cut to interior office building later. At 5 p.m., every employee wraps up their work and gathers their belongings. Michelle puts on her coat hanging on a nearby coat rack. Jerry approaches her. Their arms intertwine and they walk out of the office together. Behind them follow Raymond and Shirley, hand in hand. The four of them squeeze into the elevator together, surrounded by their co-workers. Cut to interior train car evening. Michelle and Shirley sit next to each other. Jerry and Raymond sit directly across from them. Passengers surround them. Both the women and the men have separate conversations that cannot be heard over the loud commotion of public transit. Cut to Exterior apartment building, evening. The two couples walk together along the street and approach an apartment building. All four of them walk up the steps. Cut to. Interior apartment building, continuous. After a few flights of stairs, the couples arrive at their neighboring doors on the same floor. Michelle and Jerry open the door on the left. Shirley and Raymond open the door on the right. They enter their respective apartments. Cut to. Interior left apartment, continuous. Michelle and Jerry enter a quaint, cozy, family-occupied apartment. Appearing out of the hallway, James, five, a small, lively child, rushes up to Jerry and hugs his leg. Daddy! Jerry swings James up into his arms, squeezes him tight, and spins him around. Hello, love bug! James is followed by Andrea, 20 to 25, a trans woman. She is often soft-spoken, but also very grounded and mature for her young age. He just woke up from a nap, so he's full of energy right now. Michelle smiles at Andrea. Andrea smiles back. Michelle walks over to a coat rack in the corner and removes her outerwear. On the right wall next to the coat rack is a door. Michelle opens it. On the other side is Raymond, hanging up his coat on a coat rack in the apartment on the right. Michelle walks through the door and into the right apartment. Raymond enters the left apartment. He walks over to Jerry and tussles James's hair. Hi, kiddo. Raymond leans to Jerry for a kiss. Cut to... Interior right apartment, continuous. The right apartment, a chic, less cluttered living space, has a very similar layout to the left apartment. Shirley sits in a chair in the living room. She takes off her shoes. Michelle stands near the doorway for a moment to stare at Shirley. Shirley notices and blushes. Why do you always stare like that? Michelle walks over to her. Because I love you. Michelle sits on Shirley's lap. They kiss. Cut to. Interior left apartment, continuous. Do you want to see the puzzle I did? Sure, where is it? James runs down the hallway, leading Raymond to his bedroom. Jerry watches the two of them in admiration. Andrea heads towards the apartment connecting door. 
How are you, Andrea? She stops halfway through the door frame and turns around. Good. Yeah? No big trouble today? No, like I said, he napped, so. Right. How are you doing, though? Andrea takes a step back in and shrugs. I'm okay. When was the last time you left the house? Oh, if you like me to leave, I... That's not what I meant. I, I, I just don't want you to feel stuck here all the time. Do you go to the clinic this week or next? Next Thursday. Is there a ball tonight? What? Is there a... Um... There's only... There's one nearly every night. <laughs> Jerry pulls out his wallet, takes out some cash, and offers it to Andrea. Here, take this. No. Go out and buy some drinks or something. No, I can't, no. Don't go alone. Call some friends and see if they can meet you on the corner. Jerry. Oh, please. You go have some fun. Andrea looks at the cash. She's eager but reluctant. After a beat, she smiles and takes the money. Thank you. Jerry smiles back. Andrea walks into the other apartment. Cut to... Interior right apartment, continuous. Andrea enters the apartment where Michelle and Shirley still sit on the chair. Hi there. Hey, Shirley. With a smile on her face, Andrea closes the connecting door behind her. What are you so excited about? Can I use the phone? You live here, it's your phone. Right, sorry. Andrea walks to the kitchen area where a rotary phone hangs on the wall. She dials a number and eagerly awaits an answer. Michelle and Shirley laugh to themselves. Cut to interior left apartment evening. In the kitchen, Jerry pulls big ZD out of the oven. Moments later, Jerry sets the large dining table. James almost runs into Jerry, causing him to nearly drop the dishes in his hand. James, could you go get the girls for dinner? Okay. James runs over to the connecting door and into the other apartment. Cut to interior right apartment, continuous. Passing Michelle and Shirley sitting on the couch, James zooms through the living room. Dinner! And down the hallway. Michelle and Shirley can hardly look away from the TV screen as they watch before he is gone. Cut to Interior, Andrea's bedroom, continuous. Andrea sits on her bed writing in a journal. There's a quick knock on the door before James barges into the room. Andrea looks up. Dinner! James shuts the door as quickly as he opened it. Cut to. Interior left apartment, moments later. James rushes back into the apartment and sits at the table. Raymond joins him. Jerry finishes setting the table and sits. Michelle and Shirley file in and take their seats, followed by Andrea not far behind. They begin to eat together. So Andrea's going out tonight. Andrea blushes and chuckles. Stop. I want to go. You can't go, baby. Only Andrea can go. Why? Because you weren't invited, silly. <laughs> but why? That's enough, James. We just told you why. You're just too young, buddy. Well, I hope you have fun. When was the last time any of us went out, huh? Isn't your anniversary coming up? Jerry's eyes perk up and he turns to look at Raymond. Raymond scoffs. Oh, God, please. What do you say, hon? You want to go do something to celebrate? Raymond rolls his eyes. If he won't, I will. How many times do I have to explain myself? Come on, a weekend getaway, a quick little trip to Vegas. First of all, I, I don't know what makes you think we have Vegas money. Second, I'm not comfortable with just the two of us out and... Who cares? It's your anniversary. I care, Michelle. I, I do. Hey, I get it, Ray. You're right. Really, I mean, it's safer to not risk it. So it sounds like the solution is that we go with you. I'd really rather just celebrate at home. You, you can call me paranoid all you want. I wouldn't say that, but I would say boring. Before Raymond can respond, Jerry interrupts. Home is fine. Wherever you want, love, really. 
Thank you. Can we watch the dragon movie again tomorrow? We'll see, baby. Dragon movie? What's that about? There's this big dragon, and he's super cool. Cut to interior James's bedroom, night. James lays on his bed, tucked in under the covers. Jerry sits on the edge of the bed. A lamp on the nightstand illuminates Raymond kneeling bedside near them. And then the little boy befriended the dragon, saved the village, and was crowned Prince James of the Kingdom. That's me! That's you. And now it's Prince James' bedtime. Good night. Jerry gives James a kiss on the forehead. Good night. Raymond heads towards the door. James turns over in bed, and Jerry turns out the light. Cut to... Interior right apartment, night. Michelle and Shirley drink tea and read books at their smaller dining table. Andrea enters the living room, dressed up, very glam for her night out. Oh, look at you. Do you like it? You look hot. Andrea does a few poses for Michelle and Shirley. The three of them laugh together. <laughs> uh, do you want some tea before you go? I think there's still some left. I'm okay, thanks. Ginger's probably outside already. I gotta go. Andrea throws on a coat and walks through the kitchen to the back door. Stay safe. Andrea waves and leaves. You ready for bed? Are you ready for bed? What's that supposed to mean? You wanna find out? Shirley chuckles and playfully hits Michelle on the arm as she collects the teacups and walks into the kitchen. Cut to exterior sidewalk night. Andrea walks out of an alleyway to see her friend, Ginger, 20s, also a trans woman, standing on the corner of the sidewalk. She is dressed up as well and wears a full face of makeup. Let's go, bitch! <laughs> Andrea runs over to Ginger and hugs her. Oh, it's so good to see you! Where have you been? We miss you, girl. Where's Dinah? Uh, down at Clay's finishing up a shift. We got to pick her up. She's working at Clay's. She's been going strong a few weeks now. Cut to interior Raymond and Jerry's bedroom, night. Raymond lays in bed reading a magazine. Jerry finishes putting on pajamas. What do you think about visiting school soon? Did we agree to go private? I mean, if that's really what you think we should do. It is, Jer. I'm... I'm telling you, it's safer. Yeah, I, I get it. I, I just want to be able to pay Andrea still is all. Raymond looks up from his magazine. Shouldn't she just find another job? Well, eventually, sure, but she at least needs her hormones. And, and James needs to go to school. Yes, honey. We all need things. Cut to... Interior, exterior, Clay's Diner, night. Andrea and Ginger approach Clay's, a tiny local diner. Through the window, they wave to Dinah, 20s, another trans woman. She wears a waitress uniform and cleans off a table inside. Dinah sees them and waves back. She rushes to the back of the diner. How's that fire and the kids? Actually been kind of rough the last few days. Vicky got locked up. What? Vicky? Yeah, and Saf's been in a real shit mood about it. It's really bringing the rest of us down, too. That's awful. Vicky of all people. I know, that poor thing. The diner door opens and out walks Dinah. She buttons up her jacket. Damn, Ginger, who's your friend here? Hey, Dinah. Andrea and Dinah hug. I should suck you in the face right now. When was the last time I saw you? A couple walks into the diner, looking at the three of them. I don't know, but you sure as hell weren't here. Good for you. Yeah, just wait. Soon I'll have my own place. Ginger will come with me, and you're going to wish you lived with us. Cut to interior Raymond and Jerry's bedroom, night. Jerry climbs into bed next to Raymond. Raymond puts the magazine down on the nightstand, followed by his reading glasses. I just think we should prioritize our child, that's all. 
well, what if Michelle or Shirley needed a medication that they couldn't afford? That's different. How is it different? I just, I don't know. We haven't known her that long. <laughs> well, if you're gonna pull that, we haven't exactly known James that long either. James can't get a job of his own. Andrea can. Cut to. Exterior, Clay's diner, same. You bring the dress I told you about? Ginger digs into her purse and pulls out a wadded up dress. Got it right here in the shoes. Ginger's face turns pale and her eyes get wide. You forgot the shoes, bitch? I can't go in these busted sneakers. Clay, 50s, a greasy old man, walks out of the diner. Hey, you and your little friends need to stop loitering on the premises. Dinah turns to face Clay. Excuse me? Loitering? I clocked out no more than a minute ago. Listen, kid, I took a risk with hiring you, okay? I can't have you making me look worse with your friends coming around too. The customers are complaining. Ah, well, then clearly the customers have no taste. If they eat off your menu and think that we're what's making you look bad. You know what? Why don't you get the hell off my property and never come back now? Dinah's smirk quickly fades away. Andrea and Ginger watch in shock. Cut to... Interior, Raymond and Jerry's bedroom, same. Jerry readjusts to lay down. Take out some scrolls and I'll call to make some appointments. All right. Make sure Michelle goes with you. I know. Make sure she knows. She knows. Does she? Jerry sits back up. What's your deal? It's not that serious. It is that serious. She needs to do these things. She will. She needs to do these things because I can't. And I okay, need you to be on top of it. Because if I can't she... be there, then... Hey, hey. Jerry grabs Raymond's face and holds their heads together. I just... I wish you wouldn't worry so much. Raymond says nothing. They've been through this before. They look at each other in the eyes for a moment. Jerry gives Raymond a kiss. They break apart. Jerry lays his head on his pillow. Raymond looks at Jerry for only a few seconds more before turning off the lamp. Cut to. Exterior sidewalk night. Andrea, Ginger, and Dinah shiver as they walk through the now falling snow. Sorry about your job, Dinah. Sorry about the shoes. Dinah says nothing. She angrily leads the way. Cut to. Interior, Michelle and Shirley's bedroom, night. Shirley lays asleep in bed. Beside her is Michelle, awake, propped up on her pillow and staring at Shirley. Michelle lightly runs her finger through Shirley's hair. Shirley turns her body towards Michelle and is startled awake by Michelle's touch. Oh, sorry. Shirley giggles quietly. It's okay. She wraps her arms around Michelle, snuggling into her. Michelle smiles, then kisses Shirley's head. Cut to. Interior school hallway, day. Sounds of young children in classrooms echo through the hall. James sits on a chair, kicking his dangling feet. Next to him sits Jerry, looking at Michelle, who sits in a chair adjacent from the two. Michelle stares at the ground. She looks up when a school administrator walks by. Hi there. I'll be right with you folks. Perfect, thank you. The school administrator walks into a nearby office, closing the door behind her. Michelle watches her as she walks away. Jerry chuckles. <laughs> what? She was cute, huh? Michelle laughs. Stop it. They smile at each other, then just sit for another moment. When do I meet the other kids? Soon, but you have to wait just a few more months. Am I going to make friends at school? Of course you'll make friends. You know, Daddy and I met at one of our schools and we're best friends. Well, I already have a best friend. You do? Yeah, Andrea. Jerry and Michelle glance at each other, smiling. Well, then you can make regular friends. James nods and goes back to kicking his dangling feet. That was really nice. 
what you did for Andrea the other day. I know she loved that. She needed that. You're so good to her. Oh, well, now you stop it. You are. I'm just treating her nicer than most people do. Yeah, I guess you're right. I wish I could do more. Not even for her, for everyone, you know, but. The school just... administrator opens the office door. Come on in. Jerry and Michelle stand up. Jerry grabs James's hand to help him off the chair. They follow the school administrator into the office. Cut to interior diner day. Michelle, Jerry, and James sit at a booth with finished plates of food sitting in front of them. Do you ever think about what it would feel like to tell the truth? A waitress approaches the table. She takes the dirty dishes and places a milkshake in front of James. James grabs the straw and starts drinking immediately. Thank you. The waitress nods and walks away. Honestly, all the time. Me too. Sometimes I fantasize about joining the movement, one of those organizations, you know? You should do it. No, no. Yeah, yeah, you should. I'll do it if you do it. <laughs> a beat. Jerry really considers it for a moment, but then he laughs it off. It's a good thing we have going, though. Is it? You don't think so? I mean, it's smart. It works, but I don't know. Sometimes it feels so... I guess I just didn't think about how it's always gonna be like this. Until death do us part, babe. You got me for forever. <laughs> I chuckle. Uh, I'm sure it'd feel great to, you know, don't get me wrong, but it feels like the bad still outweighs the good right now. You don't think that's just the stick up Raymond's ass talking? <laughs> what does stick up ass mean? Jerry shoots Michelle a look. Michelle tries not to laugh. Don't say that, James. Why? It's a bad word. Kids can't say that. Michelle smiles at James, then looks back to Jerry, still suppressing her laugh. Jerry rolls his eyes at her. Sorry. <laughs> but what, what you're saying is you'd do it if you could? Of course I would. Then let's just do it. Jerry hesitates. We, we can't just. Why don't we bring it up tonight? Jerry laughs. <laughs> yeah, okay. Wait, seriously, why not? There's no way they'll do it. Not anytime soon. I think we could convince them if we tried. Ray wouldn't want to. But you do. It doesn't matter what I want. I'm not going to make someone do something that they're not ready to do. A beat. Michelle sighs. I don't think Ray is ever going to be ready. But you think Shirley will? Maybe. Silence. You're probably right, though. They're both too cautious for their own good. We're quite the matchmakers, aren't we? <laughs> Yeah, they're perfect for each other. They chuckle again. Jerry notices James still drinking, almost done with his milkshake. It's slowed down there, buddy. Cut to... Interior right apartment, morning. Shirley finishes drinking a cup of coffee in the kitchen. She takes a bite of toast. Michelle enters the kitchen as she buttons up her blouse. Shirley feeds her a bite of toast. Cut to... Interior left apartment, same. Raymond and James sit at the table finishing scrambled eggs and orange juice. Jerry cleans up in the kitchen. You almost done, Ray? Uh, yep, uh, here I come. Raymond chugs the rest of his orange juice, grabs the dishes, and brings them into the kitchen. Watching Raymond, James attempts to chug his orange juice as well. Cut to... Interior right apartment, continuous. Shirley rinses her coffee mug as Michelle eats her toasts. Where's Andrea? I'm here. Andrea appears from the hallway. She rubs her head. I'm up, I'm up. Is there more coffee? 
Shirley pours the rest of the coffee from the coffee pot into a mug and hands it to Andrea. Cut to. Interior left apartment, same. James spills his orange juice all over himself. Oopsie. Jerry grabs a dish towel and hurries over to James. Oopsies, what'd you do, bud? Drink fast, like Ray Ray. Jerry looks over to Raymond, who shrugs back to Jerry. Jerry wipes up the mess and around James. Do as Ray Ray says, not as Ray Ray does. <laughs> Cut to interior right apartment. Moments later, standing by the connecting door, Michelle and Shirley kiss each other goodbye. Cut to interior left apartment continuous. Michelle enters through the connecting door. Raymond puts on his shoes. Jerry kneels down to talk to James. And you'll be good for Andrea like always, right? Right. Remember, she can't control what's on the TV. So you can't get upset with her about it, okay? Okay. All right. I love you. Jerry kisses James on the forehead. Love you, Daddy. Raymond tussles James's hair. Love you, kiddo. Love you, Ray Ray. Andrea enters with her cup of coffee in hand. Jerry grabs his coat from the coat rack. Love you. They kiss and Raymond enters the other apartment. You ready? Yep. Jerry and Michelle head toward the front door. Bye bye. See you later. Jerry and Michelle walk out the front door. Cut to. Interior apartment building continuous. Jerry and Michelle close the door behind them. Next door, Shirley and Raymond do the same. The couples head down the stairs. Cut to. Interior office building, day. Everybody at the office works at the same busy pace as before. Michelle works at her desk. Linda approaches her, interrupting her work. Are you anxious or what? What? Why? You haven't heard the rumor going around? At her desk, Shirley perks her head up. She nonchalantly eavesdrops on the conversation. No, but I'm sure you have. Well, it's no big secret. I heard some of the guys talking about how Harold's retiring next month and someone needs to replace him. Oh, yeah? Word is, Jerry is a major contender. Oh? I can't believe you haven't heard about this. Well, I usually hear these kinds of things from you first, Linda. Oh, that is so nice. Tell Terry I'm rooting for you, too. All right. Linda returns to her desk. Michelle and Shirley exchange glances. Cut to. Interior office building, day. Jerry sits at his cubicle. Other salesmen stand around him in conversation. Come on, I've been here half as long as you have. It's your record, man. You gotta look at the numbers. Thompson approaches Jerry's cubicle. Excuse me, fellas. Mind if I have a quick word? The salesmen whisper to themselves as they walk away. What's going on, Thompson? I, uh, I have a favor to ask. How can I help? Uh, Palmer called in sick, and he had a closure meeting with that florist over on Wells today. You want me to close this deal? Uh, it's been uh, already rescheduled once, and the lady who runs the place can be a bit uh, particular. But she'd be great for business if we can get her. When is it? 1.30. 1.30? Yeah, I know, I know. It's short notice. I'm sorry. You can blame Palmer for that. But I'd really love a closer like you to seal the deal on this. Oh, sure. I appreciate you thinking of me. Thanks, Power. I'll remember this one. You're going to want to get out of here soon if you're going to make it on time. Go ahead into his files for that client info. Right. I'll leave soon. I should probably stop by Raymond's office since I'm assigned. Oh, don't worry about Ray. I'm sure he's well aware of how great you're doing. You can update him when you get back. But keep me posted about it. You got it. 
Thompson walks away. Jerry sighs to himself. Cut to. Interior office building moments later. Jerry, wearing his coat and carrying a briefcase, walks up to Michelle's desk. Well, hello. I heard you're in the running for a promotion. Yeah, apparently. And if this goes well, I might have it in the back. I have to go close a deal for Doug all of a sudden. Right now? Right now. Could you call Ray for me and Tom that I won't be there for the two o'clock today? Yeah, sure. Thanks, hon. Jerry leans over and gives Michelle a kiss on the cheek. Be safe. It's supposed to get worse out there any minute now. Will do. I love you. Jerry walks away. Good luck. Jerry gives a quick wave before he leaves the office. Cut to... Interior office building later. A blizzard outside makes the office windows nearly impossible to see through. Raymond walks up to Shirley's desk. Hello, Mr. Walker. Raymond's tone is hushed and he leans close to Shirley. Hey, uh, did you see Jerry come back yet? Shirley looks at a clock on the wall that reads close to 4.30 p.m. No, I, I didn't. Has he called? Shirley looks over to Michelle with concern. Michelle looks back, confused. Not that I know of. Raymond takes a deep breath. I'm sure he's on his way back. I'm gonna ask Michelle if he's called. Okay. Raymond walks over to Michelle's desk. Shirley watches. Hey, has Jerry called or anything? No, no, he hasn't. He's not back yet. Is he? No, he's not. Shirley and Michelle exchange glances again. Michelle looks back to Raymond to see increasing worry in his eyes. Cut to. Interior Thompson's office. Moments later. Thompson sits at his desk, flipping through papers and smoking a cigarette. A knock at the door. Who is it? Michelle Bauer. Could I come in? Yeah, come on in. Michelle enters. Thompson keeps his focus on his papers. Hey, Thompson, I'm sorry to bother you, but uh, Jerry left for that meeting a while ago and isn't back yet. You haven't heard anything, have you? Uh, no, I haven't. It's pretty bad out there. I'm sure it's just taking him longer than usual. Michelle stares at Thompson. He doesn't even glance up. I'm sorry to pry, sir. Is is there any way we could contact that client just to get an idea of where he's at? Thompson raises his eyebrows, looking at Michelle now. Well, you see, uh, this client is, is easily irritable. And I'd rather not bother her. I, I get it. Uh, you're right. I'm sure I'm just being paranoid. Sorry. Michelle starts to leave. Thompson glances at the blizzard outside the window. Michelle! She turns back around. L let me be the one to call, okay? Thank you, sir. Cut to. Interior office building moments later. Michelle walks by the break room. Through the window, she sees Raymond and Shirley. They are alone. Shirley puts her hand on Raymond's shoulder as he talks. Michelle returns to her desk. Linda, at her desk, motions for Michelle to come see her. Michelle politely smiles back. Again, Linda motions for Michelle to join her. Michelle shakes her head no. Linda tries one more time, this time with even more eagerness. Michelle's phone starts ringing. Michelle gestures to the phone and shrugs to Linda. She picks up the phone. Cut to... Interior break room, moments later. Michelle enters the break room where Raymond and Shirley still sit. Uh, any word? Michelle takes a seat near them. She lights a cigarette. Cut to. Interior office building, later. The wall clock hits 5 p.m. Everyone in the office gathers their belongings. Raymond approaches Shirley near her desk as she puts on her coat. He is emotionless but gives Shirley a kiss. Shirley looks over to Michelle, who gathers her coat and hat. Various employees leave the office. Raymond and Shirley meet Michelle at her desk. No one says a word. They just exchange looks of uncertainty. The three of them walk out of the office. Raymond and Shirley walk hand in hand. Michelle walks alone behind them. 
Cut to interior train car evening. Michelle and Shirley silently stare at Raymond, who sits across from them. All three of them are wet from the snow. Raymond holds his head in his hands. Cut to exterior apartment building evening. Michelle, Shirley, and Raymond trudge through the heavy snow. Cut to interior left apartment evening. James and Andrea sit on the couch watching TV. Michelle enters the apartment and James jumps up from his seat. Noticing Jerry's absence, Andrea looks at Michelle confused. Where's daddy? Michelle glances to Andrea before kneeling down to talk to James. He's still at work, buddy. I'm sure he'll be back soon. Andrea stands and stares at Michelle concerned. Michelle looks back but doesn't say anything. Raymond enters through the connecting door. Michelle exits into the other apartment. Andrea follows her. Why is daddy still at work? Raymond picks up James. Cut to interior right apartment continuous. Michelle and Andrea enter. Andrea closes the door behind her. Shirley paces in the living room. What happened? We don't know. He left for a meeting and never came back. What? He left around one. The client he met with said he left her shop just before three. Which means he should have been back no later than four. It could be the weather, the snow. We made it back just fine. Maybe he just stopped to talk to someone. You know, you know how he is. Like how he met me. He could have met someone, maybe. Who is he talking to in the blizzard? He's probably on the way here. Why wouldn't he stop somewhere to call? He would have let someone know if something happened. Do you think something did? A beat. The three of them exchange worried glances. Suddenly, Raymond bursts through the connecting door. The phone's ringing. Shirley and Andrea look at Michelle. Michelle hurries into the other apartment. Cut to. Interior left apartment continuous. The phone in the kitchen rings. Michelle quickly walks past James to answer it. Hello? Yes, that's me. A voice speaks on the other end, but it's indistinct. Michelle listens. Raymond, Shirley, and Andrea stand in the doorway, watching Michelle on the phone. As Michelle listens, her eyes widen and her hand starts to shake. She glances over to the others in the doorway. Raymond sees Michelle's face. No. Yeah. Noticing his reaction, Michelle turns away from Raymond, unable to look at him. Raymond chokes up. Shirley gasps slightly, covering her mouth. No. 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 A wave of shock rushes over Andrea, but only for a split second before she rushes over to James, scoops him up, and brings him into the right apartment. Michelle continues to listen to the voice on the phone, heart sinking. Cut to black. Dog, written by Andrew Shire. Interior, early evening, living room, summer. Abraham, a man in his 70s, sits at his dining room table, looking through a photo album. Removing his spectacles, he takes a moment to reflect. People come and people go, and in time, they'll let you know who they really are and what they want, their desires, hopes, and fears, with the end approaching ever near. But who am I, you ask? Well, this old face you see is just a mask. Leaving the photo album open, he glances over to where the apple-shaped mirror is hung. We see the mirror on the hallway wall. He squints. Abraham is standing at the apple-shaped mirror, looking back at an empty table and chair where he was previously seated. The photo album is now closed. 
Interior morning hallway. Spring. He turns to view his reflection in the mirror. Touching his hair and rubbing his chin, he takes in the image. I am old, standing on top, appearing slightly bald. Time has sped up since the age of 20. As a youth, I thought the years ahead were plenty. Perhaps my race should have ended years ago. I don't know, full of regret for all the girls I never kissed. What other things have I missed? So I wear it, and the cap fits, like a rerun of old television clips. Turning his head to face the window, he sees himself standing there. Standing at the window, he looks back to where the apple-shaped mirror is hung. We see an empty hallway. Abraham slowly turns his head to gaze out of the window. Interior afternoon, living room. Autumn. We see worms wriggling through the soil. Autumn leaves are blown across the lawn. Now into my autumn years, I see the leaves browning and falling to the ground and know downward is where I'm bound. Food for the worms enriching the soil. Was it worth the sweat and toil? He lowers his eyes to the floor. We don't see what has caught his attention. Hello, dog. You're still here by my side. I wonder where you go. Where is it you hide? I'm glad you're watching over me as I you. Now the question is, what should we do? Interior evening, kitchen, winter. Abraham is facing the kitchen window. He stares back at the empty rocking chair. Opening a kitchen cupboard, he removes a tin of dog food. He begins to open the can. Placing the food in a dog's bowl, which has the word dog written in it. He lowers the bowl to the floor. On standing, he takes in the view from his kitchen window. No soul out today, all be getting on with their tiny lives, clocking out at a quarter to five, and then home to enjoy dinner with their wives. But not everyone. Interior early morning, dining room, summer. Looking towards his rocking chair, he sees himself sleeping. On waking, he gazes back to the kitchen window. There is no one there. He turns to look at the floor and reaches his hand out as if stroking the dog. Shall you and I take that stroll? I'll put on my coat and assume the role. We'll head out before it gets too dark. Take a shortcut through the park. Interior afternoon hallway, birthday. We hear the phone ring. He turns his head sharply to hear. We see the phone has seven missed calls flashing on its digital receiver. Abraham is now seated in the rocking chair, which is situated in the hallway. There is a 70th birthday card on the phone table. Expecting a call, but it never rings, amongst other things. So I'll try and relax and just enjoy the wait. If it never bells, I'll have cheated fate. Yes, I know, I know I'm being reflective. I see it's all subjective and I take comfort in the fact that it's just my own perspective. Abraham reaches in the direction of the phone. Interior lunchtime, bedroom, spring. His hand lands on a pile of handkerchiefs. The handkerchiefs are on the bedside table. He picks one up and begins to neatly fold it. 
He pats the bed and looks down at the floor. While we grow old, we find things to clean and fold. The past releases its hold, and our memories are easy to mold. At least that's what we're sold. Interior night, dining room, Christmas. We follow his eyes downward. Abraham has now returned to the dining room table. His eyes follow something on the ground. Are you asleep? You haven't made a peep. Putting on his spectacles, his mood changes suddenly. There is a half-open bottle of red wine. Next to it sits a modest wine glass. He pours himself a small glass of red wine. He takes a sip and thinks quietly to himself. Looking towards the cupboard, he sees himself down on his knees. He proceeds to open its double doors. He takes out a Bible. Searching for a passage, he finds it and runs his finger along the sentence. John chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. A tear rolls down his cheek. He looks up from the page to see the dog has moved. It's like the resurrection. <laughs> that was a strange inflection. He raises his head as if to look at someone's face. Interior morning, kitchen, Easter. Standing in the kitchen, he looks back to the dining room to see the cupboard and the Bible are now closed. Looking at the kitchen floor, we see that the dog bowl is empty and the word dog now appears to look like God. Now that we're both awake, let us take that walk beside the lake. Let us stride and paddle through the streams, indulging ourselves in lucid dreams until the night befriends us all and the piper makes his final call. He puts on his coat, adjusting the sleeves. He takes the dog leash in his hand and picks up his walking stick that rests against the radiator. Grasping the door handle tightly, he opens the kitchen door halfway. He becomes enveloped in a strong white light.